Everybody to the panel today, which uh, is on e-commerce. Of course, um, e-commerce Southeast Asia is riding high on the pandemic boom. And I think today we've got a panel of esteemed uh, guests here. And of course, maybe we'll give a chance to the guests to introduce themselves. And maybe I'll do a bit of introduction on myself, followed by a few questions. And then we can continue just um, with, with follow-up questions. Yeah, Gulio, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks, Ganesh. And uh, well, good morning, nearly afternoon to everybody. Uh, name's Julio. Uh, as, uh, as the host introduced, I work for Zalora. Uh, I've been with them for approximately eight years, uh, running through a few positions across Southeast Asia. Uh, but at the moment, based in KL, uh, which is uh, the largest office for the company, and uh, overviewing what we call the commercial function. The commercial function in Zalora basically means uh, the management of the company's working capital, the company's inventory, and in shorter words, everything that goes live on the website as a product. Um, I'll pass to Casey next. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Casey, uh, co-founder and CFO at Mellow Fashion. Uh, Mello is a uh, omni-channel platform for fashion, and we're based in Bangkok. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we have a network of about 19 stores across uh, Thailand and Singapore at the moment, um, and uh, also focus on e-commerce, of course. Um, I've been in the region for the last eight years and uh, really seen the uh, acceleration of e-commerce adoption during that time. Thank you. Sure. And um, Joel? Hi, uh, I'm Joel, co-founder of Shopback. So, um, you know, we, we started since 2014 uh, till now. Um, essentially, we are marketing solutions uh, for partners. And uh, I think the only difference uh, that people know us for is that we, we charge on a cost per sale model. So we have about 20 million users and our goal is really to drive uh, our users to shop more, uh, especially during these times on, on our e-commerce partners. Recently, we've also launched uh, offline as well. So we're trying to get uh, users to go offline, buy more food, um, engage in uh, spars, uh, as well as uh, being able to buy retail stores offline as well. So thanks for having me on the panel. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I think uh, let's just get into the first question. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the growth of your respective businesses? Um, Julio? Um, thanks, Ganesh. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been a, a rocky ride uh, and it's been actually in, in many ways from a business development standpoint, it's been fun to, to adapt to it and, and ride through it. Uh, you know, it started badly. So, you know, the, the first weeks of lockdown back in uh, March were simply, uh, simply took away consumer confidence and consumer optimism. And Zalora is a fashion platform. So it's something that you, you buy out of optimism, you buy out of uh, an event and an occasion. And so we, so we had a difficult week. Uh, this said it was a week for us because then what happened the week after that was that consumer sentiment stabilized. And uh, with uh, offline stores in many countries not reachable, we became kind of the, the solution um, for buying fashion. It did destabilize the back end of our business more than the front end. So in the end, demand restabilized, went back to what it was, in some cases higher. Uh, but from a back end perspective, there was a lot of firefighting needed because what people started buying was completely different from what they were buying pre-pandemic. So the so-called women's apparel, dresses, occasion wear, workwear, dropped off a cliff, <laughs> while uh, stuff like uh, comfort wear, lingerie, sportswear peaked. And that naturally means changing your entire inventory and your entire setup uh, when your business carries inventory uh, and is not purely a digital service. Anyways, I'll let the others add to it. Uh, in the end, as e-commerce players, we cannot complain. Uh, the pandemic has in some ways actually boosted digital adoption. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're also at the same time, we collaborate with offline brands and our, most of our partners are offline players. So uh, it's also a moment in which we work very closely on uh, helping them weather the storm. Yeah, Casey? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> a lot of uh, what was said resonates with me quite a bit as well. Um, you know, the, the beginning was quite tough, a lot of things to kind of figure out, but ultimately I think e-commerce, um, you know, benefited in many ways um, from, from the 
adoption um, of, of digitalization across the board. Um, I think for us, um, <clears throat> you know, just to reflect on on the changes in terms of merchandising, um, also, you know, the, the marketing message and, and the way that you communicate with your customers and build that community uh, also changed quite a bit. So, you know, we, we typically uh, do a, you know, spring summer collection where we hold an event um, and it's a big production. Um, and <clears throat> we were able to actually manage to do the um, content production through Zoom with a lot of our um, influencer network and, and such. Um, obviously, we, we also have a, a network of physical stores. Um, so while e-commerce, I think, benefited um, the stores obviously had to shut down for, for a couple months. Um, a big part of our value proposition is our omni-channel service. And that, I, I think we were all quite surprised that when, when things kind of return to normal uh, a little bit, at least in, in Thailand, um, that the omni-channel side actually picked uh, right back up as well. Sure. And Casey, overall, since you've got physical and online, overall, has your sales gone up or stagnant or gone down since you've got uh, and on a combined basis? It went down temporarily when the stores closed uh, in, in, in April and, and May. Um, mm -hmm. But but since then, I think it's bounced back pretty strongly. I think we've been pretty fortunate in, in, um, in Thailand, at least. Uh, with, and it's back higher stores. than the original level or the same level? Yeah. Higher. Okay. That's, Retail that's is about the same, but e-commerce is, is up quite a bit. Sure. Uh, Joel, on your experience, maybe? Yeah, so for us, I, we have different verticals. So uh, I think each vertical sort of adapted to, to that, right? So I think for travel, uh, we see a big dip, especially uh, for cross-border travel. Uh, what we've been seeing is that for markets that have sort of gotten uh, COVID a little bit better under control, uh, we see that domestic tourism is actually... Uh, taken off uh, quite a bit, right? So I, I think even before, um, I think the, the lockdown happening in Malaysia, we, we actually saw a spike uh, in, in, in travel. There was definitely an initial dip. Uh, there was a lockdown, but once the lockdown was lifted, uh, travel, domestic tourism actually returned, especially when uh, cross uh, state uh, travel was allowed. So that was good. I think Thailand, we see that as well. And, and even for Singapore, staycations are on the rise. So I, I think what we see is that uh, the different Industries are actually sort of adapting to to the to the new normals uh, that that's there, and that's for travel. Uh, increasingly, we see more brands, which is uh, uh brands.com, right? They have their own website. Uh, they want to push more of it now. They're actually much open, uh, much more open to having calls and 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 taking a, a discussion, right? Just to see how we're able to drive traffic and uh, sales to them. So they they do understand that you know this has. Uh, this pandemic has actually forced them to look at online channel as a necessity rather than a good to have. So that I think has really pushed a lot of them to explore this internally, both from a, a execution level as well as on a management level. They are more open to trying new things. Uh, uh, I, I think that the last one is really on uh, necessities. So there's definitely a big spike in, in necessities uh, that, that people need. So we see a big boom in food delivery. Uh, uh, buying necessities from marketplaces as well. And, and that actually has brought on a lot of users that otherwise would not have bought online. So we see, uh, number one, the, the types of users coming in were actually quite different from the demographic we previously had. And, and I think that's a good thing, right? Because that, that means that uh, if you look at it, the pandemic has actually pushed e-commerce a few years ahead than, than what it was previously planned to be. And you get demographics that you otherwise would not have gotten. And I believe it's just a sick way, right? Once they start buying necessities, uh, online, uh, it's just a matter of time before they branch out to other more uh, aspirational verticals. Sure, and um, Joel, since you're at it, I think one of the focuses for marketplaces, for example, is to kind of focus on profitability. I think a lot of marketplaces now, they're close to, the, when they were far from profitability before, they will be closer to profitability today. And with that, they may be a bit more sensitive on giving price discounts. Has that affected your business in any way? Um, so I, I think different marketplaces are different in, in, in their outlook. Uh, but I think definitely a lot of marketplaces are not looking closer at unit economics. Uh, maybe not, not totally on profitability, but unit economics or what they're doing, as well as uh, trying to see how they can work closer with 
their partners, right? So a lot, uh, you see that I think marketplaces are still doing a lot of um, different offers, uh, but these times uh, it might actually be more funded by the brands themselves. So I just give an example, we're working closer to say with Lazada and, and Shopee, whereby, you know, they have affiliate marketing solutions, whereby it's actually the brands or the sellers funding that. So you, you would notice that actually in this pandemic, a lot of these brands and, and sellers are actually very hungry, right? They want to grow more and online has become a necessity. So they're actually willing to, to, uh, to fund this if they can help you, if you can help them grow sales uh, online, right? So I, I think to, to your point, I would say that uh, marketplaces are more uh, uh, stringent now on unit economics, uh, uh, unsure about, you know, profitability or growth, but more on unit economics, I think they, they're very focused on that. Uh, but secondly, also, I think they are in this... Uh, um, Cross uh, sort of like this lucky spot, right? Whereby uh, the brands and, and sellers themselves also want to uh, uh, grow this even more. So actually, you would see that a lot more brands and sellers are actually pushing uh, this uh, much more on their side, right? And you would see them trying to invest more money in marketplaces to grow there. So it's, I would say, the, the, from a consumer point of view, you actually, the, the offers and discounts are actually even more, if you, if you were to ask me. It's just that, that the, the, the cost has actually shifted more towards the. Yeah. Brands and the sellers. Yeah, 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 got it. Julio, do you have any comments on that? I mean, I'm completely aligned to what Joel is saying. Um, uh, look, we've seen two things uh, from 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 the supply point of view, and it is that, uh, of course, we as platforms uh, have to start being a little bit more prudential. No, so a, a more volatile world means also a world where financial planning is more complicated, and as such, there is a shift towards. Uh, being a bit more careful about our bottom line uh, than maybe we were before. And, and it's simply because we we fear another dip of say two weeks or three weeks in sales can be in one country, can be another, can be stuff like Philippines that closed down e-commerce for actually two full months, um, even e-commerce. Um, and and at the same time though, on the supply side, and you know, Zalora works with a couple of thousand brands, what we see is that those brands have an opposite problem. So they have an inventory problem. They have inventory that is stuck in Changi Airport when Changi Airport is closed. They have inventory stuck in malls when the malls are closed. And right now, moving that inventory and the cash flow tied to it is actually more important than bottom line profitability at unit economics level for sure. those brands specifically. So in that case, we partner directly with them to have at least in a temporary measure, and this was more true in Q2 than in Q3, to move cash flow and unlock cash flow than per se unit economics. Unit economics is the long-term game uh, for our suppliers, but the Q2 inventory is just a flood of inventory that's coming from offline. And remember that pre-pandemic offline was still 90 to 95% of volumes in fashion, and that is stuck. Um, so even selling it at a high discount means releasing cash for those organizations that they can reinvest. So yes, we're seeing a lot more subsidies from brands. We do though believe that is a temporary thing, um, sure. meaning they will go back to PL more important than balance sheet or PL balanced with balance sheet uh, as they exit from the inventory issue that the pandemic has created. Sure. I think um, from our perspective, um, what we are seeing in Commerce or Asia, so we enable brands basically to sell across multiple marketplaces. We have seen actually the home and living category is one category that's been growing quite well. In fact, overall GMB's home and living has gone up, I think for us five to 10 times, um, whereas the overall e-commerce has grown up, gone up three times. So I think we're seeing very positive increase, uh, especially in traditional uh, e-commerce uh, serving brands especially in the home and living uh, sector. I guess the next thing is, how do you see the funding environment today with that kind of uh, growth factor? Uh, how do you see the funding environment affecting e-commerce companies today? Uh, Joel? Yeah, so I, 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 I think that um, funding or that VCs will always go after companies that can show uh, growth scale as well as a good unit economics. So I, I think this pandemic actually helped uh, push forward digitali digitalization by, by quite a few years. So I, I would actually presume that, that uh, um, uh, funding actually get, um, uh, I think the funding will be more selective. So it will go yeah. to le lesser group of companies, but for those select group of companies, I, I think they would find even much easier to raise funding, right? Because um, sure. during this time... Joel, is that a presumption or is that experience? 
No, no, no. It's a presumption, right? I'm just oh. giving my opinion, right? I, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, but I think. What about experience? Do you have you experienced anything? I mean, uh, when you talk to investors, or so I, I think for for investors, I, I think uh, it's really about same thing, right? They they just go back to what 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 is most important, right? Like basics. What 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 your numbers? Uh, what is the opportunity that you have? And definitely, this pandemic has shown that e-commerce has uh. Uh, yeah. bigger, uh, faster growth that, that, that we expected, right? So I, yeah. I think that's definitely helpful. But uh, I, I think on, on our side, uh, you know, we, we don't want to predict the market. But but for me, how I personally think about it is that, uh, you know, the the funding money would always go after um, good companies. So as long as numbers are, are good, unit economics uh, continue to, to, to do well, yeah. I, I see no reason why, uh, you know, this pandemic would actually affect funding. In, in fact, I think it would fuel more funding for, for groups sure. of companies to, to sure. increase during this period of time. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Casey, anything from your end? On any, any experience you have to share? Yeah, I think it, it oftentimes comes down to the individual investor and, and what they currently have in their portfolio, right? I think if, if you have, you know, portfolio companies that are uh, heavily impacted by the pandemic, you know, they tend to be a bit more cautious. Um, I, I, obviously, e-commerce has has grown pretty significantly. Um, so there's definitely a lot of interest um, around there. I think the concern and, and it, it I feel like the sentiment kind of shifts back and forth, though every every couple months. Um, and I, I think currently, it's uh, the shifting is you know a, a worry about what the longer term economic impact is um, of the pandemic if it doesn't uh, subside. Sure, Julio, from your end. Well, uh, look, I know first a disclaimer. I mean, we, we listed, we IPO'd a year and a half ago. So we're currently, you know, in, in different type of discussions. We're looking at, you know, joining a new exchange traded fund uh, rather than talking to venture capitalists or angels. But look, look, what I'm seeing maybe from my supplier standpoint is the following. So uh, of course, the stocks, so the publicly listed e-commerce companies have uh, exploded across the world in terms of valuations, whether it's a companies like yours, Ganesh, so you know, the exemplification is Shopify or, or companies uh, like uh, Global Fashion Group, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, so direct players. But um, what I'm seeing more now is more in the, um, so there's a lot more push towards the investment in direct to consumer brands, uh, whether online or offline, requires a very strong online strategy, if not an online strategy first. So uh, we had seen in the past some direct-to-consumer investments happening for brands that had a weaker online presence. I think nowadays, direct-to-consumer plays, whether in beauty, home and living or fashion, which we are the brands we interact with, simply do not happen unless 51% of the revenues and of the focus is towards online channels. Now, that not necessarily means proprietary online channels. So it can be as much as you know, working with companies like yours, uh, to integrate across marketplaces or directly with the marketplaces and having a secondary brand.com, or it could be having a primary brand.com strategy like Casey has. Uh, but that is now a requirement if you want to be a principal. So if you want to create a product, a brand, something that before was a blurry line, um, now is a very clear line for investors. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think I think I hear you, Julio. It's, if you're pushing your D D two C strategy, it's all about investment strategy with majority focus on online channels. How do you think uh, shop back or giving discounts fall into that strategy, Joel? No, I I, I think for us it, it's it's twofold, right? One one is definitely on the acquisition side. I I think we we are able to see where where customers are. Uh, uh, buying and our goal is to recommend them brands or products that they otherwise maybe have, have not discovered uh, or maybe they just need an impetus to, to jump over to. So, so that's the first one. Uh, second one, I, I think it's also on, on retargeting side, right? How, how do you help brands retarget uh, or get them to buy specific brands within that marketplace? So I, I think that that's where when you give incentives, the goal is really to incentivize them to do something that, that you know, you're trying to, to gear towards. So I, I think for a lot of marketplaces, they are actually trying to gear towards uh, bringing uh, more sales towards their, 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 their malls, right? Their last mall, shopping mall. So these are things I think we're working with them, specifically trying to understand what are their particular KPIs or key goals that they have. 
and then using incentives to try to nudge the behavior of the customer. Yeah. Sure. Okay, we've got another 10 seconds. So maybe I'll do a quick sum up. I think the future is all about digitalization and online. Am I right, guys? Right, future is all about Absolutely. digitalization yeah. and online. Uh, for D2C strategies, if I, if I can reiterate, it's all about the strategy of going online. And today is majority online, whether it's omni-channel or focusing on multiple marketplaces and web stores. Um, that said, unit economics has become a key focus. So you have to be at least cross profit profitable if you're getting into this business. And venture capital or investments, I think, are really still investing in this space, if not more than before, considering the increase in the valuations of listed companies. Uh, however, fundamentals are still key when raising money uh, in this industry today. Right, so that's a, I think, quick summary of whatever we discussed today. And um, with that, I think I'd like to end the session.